Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to talk about secrets, development time secrets, and how Microsoft has been trying to help us solve this, but I'm not sure that user secrets are really the way to go. Let me show you what I mean. So I have a pretty simple project here. Just a little web server, has some data associated with it, has some pages, and if we run this, it just runs a simple web page, and I'm pulling some data out of a database, right? When we're working in development, we have some interesting problems. So let me open up this app settings.json, which is where most of us are gonna keep the secrets we need. Uh, configuration settings, other things, but often actual secrets like the database connection string is probably the most common of these if you're using a database connection. And the problem is, as it may be hard to see, there's a little plus here, and that means that this file is going to be checked into source control. And why is that a problem? Well, of course, because we're going to put secrets in this. This is where it's going to pull them out. And if you've seen my video on how settings work, you know that it's a hierarchy. It starts with starts with app settings and goes down to user secrets and ultimately into environment variables. And for development time, I think we have a few different options here. What I find interesting is that when they added the app settings.development, I really thought this would be the place to actually keep our secrets, right? But you'll notice that by default, this is also added to the project where not treating this any different than we're not treating this as sacred to not go into some source control that might be able to have those secrets in it. Now, of course, this secret database string that I'm using here is the one that's actually working and it doesn't have any real secret. It's, it's just going to a local database, right? And with the idea that when we publish this, we'll probably use settings in Azure or use or use environment variables to override these. To get around having some settings that are, are for development only, Microsoft came up with .NET user secrets. User secrets are a way to store actual secrets that you need. Think an ID to an application someplace or a connection string to a server that is not just used for development on this machine, but might be something more secret that actually has a username and passwords in it. And the way this works is if we do .NET user secrets list, is this is going to attempt to see if we have any secrets. And we can go ahead and say, do something like set connection strings secret DB. And we're going to give it a value of foobar, right? And if we do list again, we're going to see actually that we have that stored someplace. This is outside, this is stored outside of the project, actually in a special folder in your user directory. So not even at the machine level, but really at the, at the user level. What you'll get here is a bunch of directories that are from specific GUIDs. And in fact, if you look at your project file, the CS proj, you'll see this user secrets ID, assuming you've created at least one of these. And this matches a directory here, 95C, da 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 da, right? And this just has a plain old secrets.json file in it. In fact, if I just copy it over here, we'll see that it's just a piece of JSON name value pairs. And so because this is in some remote file, it's not being included in your project. That's the idea here. You want it to not necessarily be in your project for secrets that you need to keep on the machine for the developer. And what I find interesting is it since it's tied to the machine you're on, as people go from home to work and back to home or while they're on a trip on their laptop, these secrets don't go with you. And I think that's fine. In fact, having different settings for those in different environments is probably the right idea. But I find that the way that user secrets works is a little arcane. If we look at uh, that file again, 
it's JSON. And if I wanted to sort of swap different things as I'm trying things, obviously this doesn't work. This will actually throw an error because JSON ordinarily doesn't support any sort of commenting. And so I noticed that when I was working with open source projects and projects that are outside of the Microsoft ecosystem, they use something called a .env file to do the same thing. A .env file is just a list of environment settings and their values, much like what we're doing there, but it's really tied to those environment variables. And the trick is that a project can just take that list, make environment variables, and everything will work because, again, environment variables are going to take over. This means that it's much simpler. It's a file in our project that we can look at, but that brings us back to the problem of creating it. So we'll get to that problem in a moment. Let's go ahead and create a .env file. And all an .env file is, is connection strings, secrets, db, equal foo bar flux, right? It's just a name value pair. In fact, this is, if we had put set here and run it at the console, you could see that this is exactly what it is. It is a set of configurations here. Now, of course, if you're not on Windows, that would be the value for this setting. And by just including this, you're not really going to see this work in your project. And of course, by default, you're going to see that, that the EMV file will be added to the project if you don't do anything. So first, let's take a project on GitHub that uses them. And what you'll see checked in here is not the .env file, but in fact, a sample file with the kinds of settings that this project needs with the idea of, oh, this is what it looks like, copy it to a .env, and then I can make my machine-specific settings here. And so it becomes something similar to the way app settings works, but I find it a little easier because we go back, we come back here, I could have a number of these, right? That I could much more easily swap in and swap out. One thing you'll notice that if you actually open this with Visual Studio Code, it has a formatter for them where you can see what is commented out and what isn't. But uh, I'm sure that Mads Christensen is working on a formatter for Visual Studio already. Probably is one there that I haven't installed. So how do we make this work? There is a project called .NET env.net, which can be a little confusing, but and so we can simply just say .NET add package, and there's a project called .env.net. And to use it, we're just going to go to the top of the program.cs and say .env. And let's go ahead and bring that namespace in. And all we're going to say is load. There are options you can do here, but for us, we just want to load what is that .env file. What this essentially does, it's a very small package, is just read that file in and set environment variables for the process so that when the settings are actually created here under the covers in the create builder, that it's going to include those environment variables. And so we can see that if we go over to pages, and let's create another property here. And I'm just going to set our secret to be config our secret. And what we'll use here, I'm going to go ahead and put a bang so it knows it's going to exist, is I'm going to first set it here in app settings. So our secret from app settings. And then I'll do it the same in development, right? If I just bring it here and I'll say, Dot development. And in program, let's just get rid of this .NET M for a second, just so we can see what's happening. If we run this, we'll see that we got the connection string for each call here from the app settings development, right? That's the value that we have that's interesting. And if we had it in user secrets, it would pull that as well. But I'm going to I'm going to trust that you trust me on that. But one of the other things that can be done is in the launch profiles or the debug environment, you could also set it here, right? Our secret equals from environment. 
if we run it now, because of the layering of app settings, at settings, development, user secrets, and then environment variables, and so now that we can see this is actually coming from the environment variables as well. And that's all good, but one of the other things to be aware of is that that information is in launch settings. So what happens here? Our secret gets checked into source control as well. So what if we do it with .env instead, right? If I go our secret equals from .env, and let's take it out of here, you can see .NET .env isn't working, right? It's getting it from the development. It's because we don't have this .env env load yet. Again, all this is doing is reading this .env and putting in environment variables for us from .NET env. So this is pretty low hanging fruit to use it this way. The last thing I'll talk about is, I think a bit, there are two best practices here. One is that you should have a copy here and the convention is .sample. This is never actually being used. This is just saying, I have a secret that I'm looking for, and you can set it here by going set your value or something that isn't really the secret. This would get checked in, but .env wouldn't. And the way we get that to happen is ignore local item. And now what does that actually do? It's actually gonna add a git ignore file. Now assuming that, assuming that you actually created a git ignore in the standard ways, .env is normally ignored in any case in any directory. So you just wanna make sure that when you go to check this in that it is turned off. Notice that the .NET sample is still being checked in. So when we check this into source control, those secrets are secrets for our machine only. Because the benefit of not checking it into source control isn't just to protect those secrets from prying eyes, but also so that every time someone gets this, they're not gonna overwrite their own settings with yours. Now you can certainly use user secrets that it works well. If you like it, you like it. I just don't like how sort of hidden from the project it is. And I've started to use .m files instead. What do you think? Let's talk about it down in the comments. On your way to the comments, make sure that you like and subscribe. That really helps me and I appreciate that. And I'm happy to be wrong about this. I think that part of my impetus to use .env files is that I'm already using them in my JavaScript and TypeScript files. And so having one method of thinking about it instead of having a .netism and a JavaScriptism, I think uh, makes it easier for me to sort of grapple with. Thanks for joining me for another coding short. I'll see you next time. <laughs>